In this video, Robin goes into detail of chapter 7, which is called Frameworks and Fundamentals. Now this chapter is the core component of the publication, and it sets out the critical areas of the dialogic framework. However, it is important you view the first video, which helps set the scene to Robin's work before engaging this second video. Robin writes in chapter 7 that, and I quote, the framework centerpiece is a set of eight dialogic teaching repertoires that aim to help the teacher to engage with essential aspects of classroom culture and organisation. Appropriate forms of teacher and student talk, the moves which these are typically associated with, and further moves in key areas of questioning, extending, discussion and argumentation. Welcome back, Robin. Thank you very much for joining us on uh, Nate YouTube uh, site again. And as you know, uh, Robin, this second video is devoted to finding out about dialogic teaching framework this time, professional development and how it enhances children's engagement and learning. So I'm really grateful we can look at this in greater detail. So my first question is, you referred during the first video to your framework, which is obviously outlined in chapter seven. Since it's obviously central to the approach to classroom talk that you're advocating, would you please tell us a little bit more about it? Yes, Mike, thanks. Um, the framework is, if you like, a total pedagogy. So it tries to put talk about talk in some detail, um, identify its most important features, but also mm. set it in context, in the context, the wider context of teaching. Oh. It has six segments. It starts, uh, as is necessary these days, with definition. So it says precisely what dialogic teaching is <clears throat> and what, what we mean by dialogue. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about any of these things. We don't have time, but I'm just going to pick up the, the elements. The second uh, segment is stance. Now, I'd better explain that. That's, if you like, the outlook, the attitude, the values that underpin the whole thing, because education is always necessarily underpinned by values of some kind. And I talked about these in the first video to some extent, the notion of knowledge as, as open and negotiable, the importance of respecting the pupil's viewpoint and giving the pupil space and time to talk and express his or her own ideas. So it's about human relations, relations between teacher and taught. It's about a view of the curriculum and so on. Um, so that's all that's captured in that second segment. The third is a, a set of justifications. And uh, I've already um, alluded to these in, in the first video by arguing that dialogic teaching is about oracy, but it's also about much more than oracy. And I've it's about not just about uh, enabling pupils to communicate most, more effectively, though it includes that, but it's also about enabling them to think and learn more effectively, to master their learning, uh, to relate to others, uh, and also to engage as citizens and, 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 and active members of democracy, very important in the present climate. And I also argued, and we had some discussion about this in the first video, that it's about enabling teaching itself to become more effective because through uh, dialogue, the teacher is enabled to get inside the child's head, understand how the child is thinking, um, build on the child's understandings and help the child to overcome his or her misunderstanding. So it's a much more effective way of proceeding than just on the basis of, of one word answers alone, which really gives us very little clue as to what the child is thinking and, and how much he or she, she, she is learning. So that's the third element, justifications. The fourth is a set of principles which guide the whole thing. I'll say a bit about those in a minute. The fifth is what I call repertoires, a very important element. It, this actually goes back to my earliest work on researching teaching in primary classrooms back in the uh, 1980s. Um, and that was a time you... I say you were, may remember, you're a lot, not, uh, a lot younger than I am, so maybe you won't, but it's, it was a time I was, when... I was teaching in the 80s. You were, good. Yeah. Well, there was a tendency in some schools and local authorities to say, this is the way to do it. 
There is only one way to do it. Mm. And uh, I have consistently argued against that and argued that teaching is far too complex an activity and subtle an activity. And in teaching, it's only partly about method. It's also about the personality of the teacher. Yeah. And uh, so for all these reasons, uh, it's much better to think of of, of uh, the skills for teaching in terms of repertoires, a range of skills, a range of strategies which one can deploy, but which the teacher is the person who makes the judgment about selecting what, what is going to work, what is fit for purpose, what is right for my particular circumstances and children today in this area of the curriculum. So that's the uh, the final, the, the, the penultimate feature segment mm -hmm. and the final one is what I call indicators which are practical statements as to enable us to recognize what it looks like let's say a bit more about some of these yeah. um I, I've already I think said enough about what we mean by stance and about uh justifications but let me say more, more about the principles now the argument here is that there has to be some kind of litmus test and so Although it's all about repertoire, a range of strategies the teacher chooses, in the end, if you want to judge whether it's dialogic, there are six principles which you can apply. And they are collective, supportive, reciprocal, deliberative, cumulative, purposeful. I'm afraid rather long words, but collective is the notion that we're all in this together. Yeah. That teachers and pupils share the learning experience uh, and um and are able to learn from each other. Uh, of course, learning is individual as, the, as well, but we know from Vygotsky's work, we know from how effective classrooms operate, that it's much more productive if actually there's a, a culture of sharing. The second, necessarily, is that, the second principle is that it should be supportive. Hmm. If sure. uh, it, when, when a child talks, he or she may feel, feel very exposed, uh, consequently reticent, anxious only to give the right answer. We need to get beyond that. We need to have a climate in which children feel free to say what they think and free to offer answers which might be judged wrong. Mm. Because, of course, as, as we both know, and as uh, research, particularly on children's mathematical learning shows, it's uh, from their misunderstandings that children are most likely to learn uh, yes. Yes, there's a lot of research out there. There's about. a lot of research on that. So, um, but if the climate isn't supportive, then children will clam up. So that's the second principle. The third is reciprocity. The talk should be reciprocal. So uh, we we feed off each other's ideas. We respect each other's viewpoints. We listen to each other. Uh, the next one, the fourth, is the notion of deliberation, deliberative. Uh, it, it's about uh, argument. It's about discussion. It's about testing ideas, testing hypotheses, asking questions, probing opinions. That's what deliberation is about. Yeah. The fifth principle is what I call cumulative, perhaps the most difficult. The notion that that each exchange between teacher and pupil or between pupil and pupil in groups or whatever it is, to try and build upon what goes beyond it. But before it, because otherwise learning is, learn, or the pattern of teaching is circular. So we're yeah. always trying to make forward progress. We're always taking an idea and saying, now, what can we do with that? How can we build on this? And the final principle is that it should have a purpose. It's purposeful. So uh, six principles. And then the next segment, which I've mentioned, is the idea of repertoire. Uh, and there are um, there are eight such repertoires. <clears throat> First is, uh, and I've, said, I've already said that the the idea of repertoire is in direct opposition to the notion that there is one right way to do it. Yeah. And there are those who say there is only one right way to organise effective classroom talk. Uh, I stand in opposition to that too. Uh, so here we have a repertoire, and um, the first one. That repertoire is what I call interactive culture. And I've already said a bit about this, the culture in which everything one is, is doing is set. You know? So we, we establish agreements, norms, and some people might call them ground rules, but that sounds a bit severe, mm -hmm. um, uh, concerning how, how we handle talk. We listen to each other. 
we respect each other's viewpoints. We try not to interrupt. That's extremely difficult because adults all do it all the time. Um, you know, you listen to, to Radio 4 today every morning and it's all about interrupting the, the, the interview, yes. interrupting the interview. <laughs> It's quite com combative, actually. It's like some sort of verbal combat going on, and it can make you feel quite uncomfortable. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Now, uh, we want to give and take in classrooms, but at the same time, we're dealing with children. Mm. Uh, and we, we want to encourage them to talk. So um, we really do need to establish these conversational norms, which will enable them to talk yeah. freely uh, and without fear. Uh, the second repertoire is what I call interactive settings. Uh, believe it or not, how you organize the space in the classroom, how you handle time, how you group children has a direct impact upon um, the quality of the talk. If you yeah. arrange tables in rows, then you're signaling that only one kind of talk matters. Mm. It's the kind of talk which the teacher controls and to which children respond. Yeah. If you arrange the table, push the tables together in in groups, it's suggesting that uh, really it's all about group work. Mm. And we know from Morris Galton's work way back in the 70s that that pattern of that physical layout, which still is very common, um, was uh, quite often characterized by children working in groups, but not as groups. As groups, yes. Uh, and um, so if you organise it that way, that then that's most conducive to group talk. The third one is is the horseshoe, uh, which I think was, well, I've seen it in many other countries, but in this country was was particularly um, fostered in Buckingham and Dagenham in the mid-1990s as a result of the work which um, the then Chief Inspector Roger Luxton did uh, in, in Germany and Switzerland. And he brought this idea back, and it's a it's a, it's an excellent arrangement because it's the most flexible of the lot. There mm -hmm. are three sided horseshoe, teacher yes. on the fourth side. Yeah. All the children are facing each other, so you're immediately signalling that it's a collective and reciprocal operation. Mm. And yet, it can work for whole class teaching. It can work for individual conversations between pairs, you know, just on either side. Or if you want group work, you simply bring tables, chairs around the inside. And there you have a group set up. Yeah. But however you do it, think about then the interactive settings, how you handle space and time. And then into the, 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 the meat of it all. The next repertoire, number three, is what I call learning talk. And uh, there are a number of different kinds of learning talk. What I call transactional talk, everyday talk, expository talk, explaining things. Questioning. Uh, exploring, exploring ideas, deliberation, which is argument and testing ideas, imaginative talk, very important. It doesn't feature much in the national curriculum, but it's it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Expressive talk, where you are, are are actually expressing feelings and and reacting in a felt way to your experiences, and evaluative mm. talk, where you're giving judgments. Now, it's not just the teacher who needs to master these kinds of talk. Is these, of course are different kinds of talk for learning. We want children to have the capacity to talk in these different ways. And then there's teaching talk. And I, uh, again, there's, there's there's a repertoire. Rote, now you might wonder what the Dickens wrote is doing in all this. Well, actually there is sometimes a place for rote. If we want to learn a poem yeah. or a multiplication table, then repeating it is probably the best way to do it. Mm. So for those who say rote is old hat, I would say, yes, it is old hat but it still has a place, um, as, does, yeah. as does... As does... Because, because with rote, sometimes you get rhythm, uh, and children love rhythm when, when they repeat it out together. So I can understand why there's a place for rote. Yeah, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. But no, yeah. it's all right. But, yes. but if it is only rote that you do, then maybe there's something wrong. <laughs> um, so it, it has its place, but, but think carefully about what its place might be. Yeah. Then there's recitation, which I discussed in the first uh, on, on the first video. This is the um, uh, the closed closed question, one word answer, and then you move on. Mm. Again, although I said we need to move beyond that kind of talk or not allow it to dominate as it has done traditionally, it probably does have its place. But I want to move beyond those to other kinds of teaching talk. 
the capacity to explain things, which Ted Ragg used to be so good at and which he used to argue was an essential teaching skill, yeah. to tell stories, yeah. um, to, to, to make an idea crystal clear. Uh, discussion and the ability to handle discussion is a considerable skill, considerable skill for the teacher. But if you want pupils to handle their own discussion, they too need to, uh, as it were, be trained in how to do it. Uh, deliberation and argumentation, which I've also mentioned, then, of course, dialogue itself. So so there are um, eight different kinds of teaching talk. Um, and then the, in the remaining repertoires, I go into some of these in detail. So there's a repertoire which deals solely with questioning, different ways of asking questions, different purposes, different structures, closed and open questions, um, and um, questions which are designed to uh, initiate ch children's thinking, to probe their thinking, to expand mm -hmm. their thinking. Uh, and um, uh, one distinction which I think is worth making is, is between what Martin Nystrand, an American researcher, calls test and authentic questions. Now, he says that traditionally, teachers tend to ask test questions. They're not necessarily testing children, but that's the function. So the, the, it's, a, it's a closed question. There's only one right answer. So what the teacher is doing essentially is testing whether the child knows what he or she is expected to know. Uh, the, the testing is, is, is a form of informal assessment. Yes. If getting uh, the teacher feedback about what the child has learned or needs to learn. Yes. So, yeah, that, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, but you. but if but on the other hand, it doesn't necessarily challenge the child, children to think because either they know it or they don't know it. Yeah. So what Nystrand says is that the better question is what he calls the authentic question, the one which has sufficient in it to get the child to think, and therefore. Yeah which has what we call wait time or thinking time. So instead of doing what the presenters on today, which you've already mentioned do, mm. uh, which is to ask a question and expect an instant response, and if the politicians say, um, uh, then they're in trouble. And Liz Truss, you remember, was in trouble because she took time oh, yes. to answer the question. Yes. It, it, well, she didn't actually have an answer, but um, you, you know, it, people are, are, are deemed to be inadequate if they take time to answer a question. But if you think about it, yeah. A question that is really worth answering probably does time to take time to think about. So um, a, a question should be framed so that it does get children to think. Test an authentic questions. And it's the authentic questions which you should be aiming for. Yeah. And, and the next repertoire is what I call extending. This is where you um, uh, have various strategies. And I illustrated some of these in the first video. Uh, for getting children to share, expand and clarify their thinking or where the teacher uh, probes the thinking of pupils or where children uh, examine and compare and contrast each other's thinking and where you're trying to um, uh, uh, explore evidence that the children have, the reasons which they can give for their answers and so on. That, so that's ex the, the repertoire of extending talk. And then there are a couple of others discussing and arguing, which I've also said quite a lot about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the final repertoire, uh, uh, the, the final element is, is indicators, which is, um, you know, practical statements which say what to look for. Um, you know, for example, interactions which encourage pupils to think and to think in different ways. Questions which invite more than simple recall and for imposed, imposed by the pupils as well as the teachers. Answers which are justified, followed up and built upon rather than merely received. Feedback which takes thinking forward and which is offered by the pupils as well as the teachers. We want pupils to feedback on us just as we feedback to them. Extending moves which probe and expand pupil contributions. Exchanges mm. between teacher and child which chain together into coherent and deepening lines of inquiry. So there are a number of statements like that. But the yeah. bottom line in all this, and then uh, 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 I'll stop. The bottom line in all this is a quote which I frequently use from the Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin. Uh, and he, his, his focus actually wasn't classrooms. It was humanity as a whole uh, and human culture, uh, which he regarded as 
all about dialogue. And he said, if an answer doesn't give rise to a new question from itself, then it falls out of the dialogue. And I've applied that in classrooms. Yeah. If one. you ask a question and the child gives an answer and you do nothing with it, yeah. then the thinking that lies behind that answer and the thinking which that answer might lead towards disappears. You've yeah. lost it. Yeah. So if an answer doesn't give rise to a new question, mm. it falls out of the dialogue. So, so the, 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 there's that bottom line that, again, and I'll repeat it because I said it on the first video, but it, 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 not everyone's going to be watching the first one. Mm. We must do something with what children say in order to advance their learning. So that in outline is the uh, the framework with those um, those various elements um definition stance justifications principles uh repertoires uh and uh indicators um and um it works you know we, we yeah. tested it in that education endowment foundation trial yeah. which was tested yeah. by another university and mm. it advanced uh children's learning just after after just 20 weeks um by up to two months in standardized tests of english maths and science fantastic that, that's incredible well that was uh, quite an explanation of your um framework uh thank you very much indeed for that now i'm going to ask um about implementation really is is, is the second question i've got for you which is how might teachers go about implementing the approach you've outlined uh, this uh, this session and the context of all the other pressures, because that's the problem, isn't it? There's the teacher, I think it's a great idea, but within the current pressures that they are under, um, how can they actually uh, implement uh, what, what you've discussed this afternoon? Well, um, I'll start with that second part, because uh, that may be people's anxiety. The good news about all this is that because this isn't a curriculum add-on it's it's about pedagogy it's about teaching it doesn't actually demand a significant it certainly doesn't demand, demand extra curriculum time uh, you work within your existing curriculum it's about it is simply about thinking more deeply about the kind of talk through which you to use that dreadful word, deliver the curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the word that politicians like to use about, about, yes. about education, yeah. the, the postman pat view of education. <laughs> but it, it, so yes, it will require more time because the, you, you've got to have to think, think a little bit about what, what, what you're doing. But in terms of classroom time, no, it doesn't, it doesn't take any more time. So it, it should be possible. And the teachers with whom uh, I've worked over many years on this, say, yes, actually, it hasn't demanded more of me in terms of time. It's demanded more of me in terms of my own professional thinking. Yes. But that's probably a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, in the Education Endowment Foundation project, um, and for those who haven't watched the first video, let me just briefly mention that the Education Endowment Foundation, which um, trials promising teaching approaches which might help tackle disadvantage. Between 2014 and 2017, um, uh, I, uh, I co-directed a project which trialled this approach to dialogic teaching with 5,000 pupils in uh, primary schools in Leeds, Birmingham and Bradford, a huge sample. And it trialled them by having, like clinical trials, uh, an experimental group with whom we worked. We worked with the teachers in those schools to train them to do dialogic teaching and they applied it. And a and, and a control group mm. with whom we didn't work. Yes. And they were as identical as they could be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we trained the teachers and then they put this into practice. Uh, we followed their progress and I'll explain how we did it. And, and then uh, after towards the end of the second term, <clears throat> uh, a research group from another university entirely, independently of us, went in um, and uh, tested the children 
and established that those in the group with whom we'd been working had mm. advanced the learning of those had advanced those two months by two months on uh, as judged by those standardized tests in English, maths and science. In other words, across the curriculum. That's amazing. And, and yeah. that was the first education Development for foundation project which it had a cross curricular approach and it it remains one of the biggest such studies of of uh, effective classroom talk what did we do well uh, in the book in chapter 7 i built on the the approach to professional development which we used in the project and have um modified obviously thinking of ordinary schools rather than a research project in, in, in having, having uh, ordinary schools rather than a research project in mind. Um, uh, we, we train the teachers uh, and uh, the idea was that over two terms, they should have um, a number of cycles of activity. Each cycle would be about a, a fortnight and it would have a particular focus, a focus upon a specific aspect of talk um, and uh, the focus would be achieved by starting by making a, a, a brief video tape of, 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 of a lesson or a couple of lessons, whatever the teacher wanted to do. Uh, and then just banking that. And then over the next fortnight, working intensely on, intensively on the aspect of talk that they, they, they wish to highlight. For example, questioning. And thinking really deeply about the kind of questions they asked and what they did to go back to back team, what they did with, with, with pupils' answers. And then at the end of that fortnight, uh, there would be another video uh, and they would use the two videos to look at progress. Are the questions more better focused? Are they more varied? Uh, am I really listening to what children say? Am I building on their answers? Am I probing their answers? Am I giving them time to think before giving their answers? Are their answers going somewhere? That's if you just take questioning. And so we took various aspects of the framework, you know, the different repertoires, extending, questioning, arguing, deliberation, um, uh, whole class teaching, small group work, individual work, uh, and uh, each of those became a focus for a cycle and each of them was explored on, on the basis of this videotape before and after. And then the teachers identified strengths, growth points and moved on. They did this with the help of a mentor. Now, the mentor was a colleague, you ideally not a senior colleague, so that it wouldn't look like inspection. Yeah. So what we were trying to encourage was the notion of peer mentoring. In other words, just as we encourage paired work in classrooms, so we were trying to encourage paired work in staff rooms, that that teachers would work, e work with each other to the mutual benefit of, of their teaching and to the, the general benefit of their pupils' learning. Yeah. So although one would be the mentor and the other mentee, they could actually swap roles. They could both be engaged in this. Yeah, it makes a lot of and sense. Both, and both would learn. A very different model from the top-down view of of mentoring that some think of, yes. and so the, the 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 mentor would be involved in discussions about the the planning. But above all, the mentor would come in when the teacher was looking at the video and thinking about how progress had been made over the previous two weeks, and they would talk together about the next two weeks and so on. So that's yes. how it panned out. It was it was quite intensive, but after a while, teachers got into the hang of it. And yes, they did have to find extra time, they had to have to find extra time to have a conversation with their mentor yeah. Yeah. once a fortnight, mm. sometimes more if they could manage it. And these typically lasted three quarters of an hour, an hour because they needed to look at a video clip or two while they were doing it. Yeah. But it wasn't very time consuming. And uh, quite often the, the, uh, uh, there would be a bit of a cover arranged uh, or, or um, by some arrangement. Uh, it, it wouldn't detract from the rest of of, of, of the teacher's work. Mm. Um, it required school buy-in. It obviously required head teachers to be supportive of this. Yeah. And <clears throat> although in the Education Endowment Foundation project, we worked just with year fives, 
I have worked on dialogic teaching right through from reception to secondary. So oh. I, I know it works right through at, 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 at all levels and in all key stages. And indeed, there are people who have used my framework in universities as well. So it, it, that runs from preschool to uh, to well, reception anyway, to, to higher education. Yeah. Um, uh, now, although we just in, in, on, in the Education Endowment Foundation project worked with year five, I think the ideal approach is really if a whole school takes this on, um, partly so that everyone is talking about it, you get back in the classroom and uh, back, get back in the staff room. How did it go today? And yes, we tried this and have you tried that and so on. But also and critically, because if it's only done in one class, what happens at the end of the year? Yeah. That was our worry with this project. Yeah, quite right. We know it happened. Yeah. That everything regressed. Yeah. What you want to do, just as you want um, uh, answers, questions to exploit answers and answers to be built upon, so mm. you want success in the professional development of teachers to be built upon, not negated the following year. Yeah. So if it if you do it just in year three, the question is what happens in year four? Is it a totally different pattern of teaching? Is it dialogic? So, so that is very much an issue for school leaders, I think, to take this on and say, well, mm. OK, I'd like to take it on, but I will need to get a, the maximum involvement of, of all staff. But I do stress that it isn't actually that big a deal because nothing that I've recommended um, had not done before I recommended it. In other words, um, I... Uh, even before I started work on dialogic teaching, there were classrooms that I visited where I saw this kind of teaching going on, that really good teachers instinctively understood yeah. the power of talk and understood that that it needed to be two way rather than one way. Mm. That's that's a very, very important note of encouragement, I think, that, that I'll end on before you perhaps follow up if you want to. No, I, I think that's quite right. You, you mentioned about uh, a whole school uh, development rather than a teacher going on, uh, on a course, coming back and then being completely flooded with everything else apart from what they okay. learned that day. So after a few days, it gets lost in the wash. So I think it's the right approach to take. And in, certainly in, in uh, groups of teachers, because as you say, at the end of the year, teachers move on from school to school, it can get lost. Yes. So well, uh, it, it, it needs to be part of the school uh, thinking and approach to teaching. So, yes, yes I agree. And, uh, but also, um, the idea is that, I mean, in the project, we spread it over two terms, but it, it it's not a one-off thing. As you say, it's not going on a course and coming back and, <clears throat> and yeah. hoping that something will happen, which is a very ineffective kind of professional development. It's the slow burn. It's saying now this year, yeah. And then many schools have approached me, and 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 we talked about how to. This year they're saying we're going to have a focus on classroom talk, and we're going to use your framework of dialogic teaching, yeah. and we're going to work on it over the whole year. Yeah, exactly. And gradually, incrementally, build up our, our the build up the climate and the culture and the skills, mm. um, and try and get as many teachers involved as possible. Yeah, and that that pattern of professional development has a lasting impact. Mm. I mean, schools are very, very, very good now at planning. Uh, I dare, dare even say better than ever before for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. And therefore, it's quite easy to slot in that focus over the year. And then who knows, the second year, a slightly different uh, focus, a slightly different angle to um, encouraging children and teachers to talk together to enhance learning. So for all those reasons, I think it's a grand approach. Yes. And you see, um, in the project, we had cycles of two weeks. It doesn't have to be two weeks. It's just within the project, we were very much constrained by time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. the Education yeah. Endowment and Foundation expected us to do all this work in two terms because they're, the other university is coming with, in with um, tests in the May, in the, in the beginning of the summer term or halfway through the summer term. Yes. Um, so we were under that kind of pressure. But I, we we ourselves felt and we argued that that we ought to have been allowed a full year to do this. Mm. Um, and so 
that the the approach is is much more relaxed mm. and yet but while being relaxed it still requires one to be thinking about it most of the time saying this this year what do we do this is our focus this is our professional development focus it's the quality of pupil talk and teacher talk because i said in the first video the teachers talk matters as much as the pupils because yeah. the teachers talk which empowers the pupils talk yeah. or inhibits it um so our, our focus is upon classroom talk as a whole mm. um and um you know nothing is going to change we're not changing the curriculum uh, but, but what we are doing is just raising the profile of talk across the curriculum, across all teaching, and across the entire school, actually. Really I think that's the important point. I think that's the important point, because it's all very well for researchers to come in and out of schools after a couple of turns, but actually it's the school that needs to take ownership long term for it to happen over a long period of time. Um, and... You know, maybe a couple of years down the line, then revitalize it and then continue again. And then just watch their, their standards rise as a result of all the efforts put into uh, uh, that particular strategy, if you like, of getting children to really enjoy their lessons and really engage with the, the teachers, teachers themselves learning as well, um, of this method of, of uh, teaching. So, Robin, that's great. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, just pick up your point about engagement, because although the Education Endowment Foundation proved that this works in terms of test results, mm. I would argue that it also works because it engages pupils. They actually enjoyed it. You know, being yeah. allowed to talk, being yeah. free to talk, not fearing that what one will say will be ridiculed or judged wrong, mm. engaging in discussions, having as a child someone respect one's ideas what you know how fantastic uh, and 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 we did get much higher levels of participation including from children that teachers said hadn't participated before mm. so it really did open the floodgates of talk in the best possible way yeah. so engagement motivation confidence building these are all all important products of this way of teaching as well as as the Education Government Foundation project proved the raising of tested standards. Yes. So, Robin, what can I say? But thank you very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure for a second video of what is a very pertinent part of um, dialogic teaching and the companion itself. So, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, I would say if anyone wants to get in touch with me about this, uh, there's a contact form on my website. Great. Well, that's it. That's and I think you're going to show them the website, aren't you, at some point? Yes, I'm going to show them all the details. Yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll put okay. some details on the screen as, as we talk through it all. So for all of that, thank you very much indeed. And bye for another time. Yep. Bye-bye then. Bye-bye.